I'm going to be honest with you, it's, it feels a little weird to launch into a sermon. I, it kind of feels like maybe our business isn't quite done. And, and the reason that is, I realize you may be sitting here this morning or maybe you're watching online and you may, you may think to yourself, you know, gosh, a song about anxiety and fear and depression, I mean, what's that about? Or, you know, gosh, I, I, I've never experienced anything like that. I, I, don't really, I don't really know why that's a big deal. But can I, just, can I just say to you, I promise you, at the very least, you are sitting on an on a aisle close to somebody who is dealing with one of those things. And if they're not in your family, if they're not a close friend, they're, they are somebody that God loves. Amen? And I don't know what it is about our world that we live in that produces such fear and anxiety and depression and all of these things. I promise you it has touched my life and it's touched the life of my family. And it continues to and, and we continue to claim the name of Jesus. And we will continue to do that. And as a church, we will continue to do that. Amen? Amen. We get to our invitation time this morning and maybe you feel like you need just a little bit of extra prayer over you. Let me encourage you to come. We'll make sure there are plenty of people here at the front this morning that would love to pray over you. And if you have a need, please let us help you meet that need this morning, okay? Let me invite you to take out your message notes and we're going to transition now into the message time. If you got your Bibles with you, we're going to be in two places, Acts chapter 6 and 1 Timothy 3. I know that's a lot to digest, but we'll have all the scripture on the screen behind me. Uh, make sure that you, you pull out your notes. This is a morning I really want you to write some stuff down, okay? You'll find a pen somewhere there in front of you uh, in a seat back. And yes, it has been pointed out to me by multiple people that there are a lot of fill in the blanks this morning. Yes, I am fully aware. That's how you know the Holy Spirit was moving this week, okay? And uh, that does not reflect how long the sermon's going to be. It's nothing like that, so don't worry about it. But uh, it is some important stuff. Today is actually a really important day in the life of Oakdale as we begin the process of nominating men to serve as deacon in our church. And that may not sound like the most exciting topic to you, but I promise you it is incredibly important. And let me just say this. My experience has been as a pastor, and I have served now in ministry for over 30 years, and I would tell you, you show me a healthy and thriving and growing church, and I will likely show you a church with healthy, godly, biblical deacons. And you show me the opposite in terms of church, and I'll show you a place where it's probably not very healthy and not very good. So is this important? You better believe that it is, okay? Now, because both selecting deacons and becoming a deacon are such a big responsibility, we've chosen to spend some time today helping you understand what a deacon is, what they do, and how they should be selected. And to do that, I'm going to take you through two passages of Scripture that teach us specifically about deacon ministry. I'm going to share with you how our deacon selection process works. And I'm going to give you some instructions on how you can participate in that. And then you're going to hear from a couple of our deacons, um, Marty McBee and Wade Deaver are going to come and share with you some insight into what being a deacon is like at Oakdale. Now, again, there might be the temptation for you to think that what we're going to talk about today isn't important for you or that maybe it doesn't apply to you. But I need you to understand that is not the case. Some of you who are here this morning, believe it or not, you will ultimately be ordained at some point in your life as a deacon, either at Oakdale or at another church. And every one of you here who is a member of Oakdale is responsible to help us select godly men over the next month who will serve as deacons here in our church. That's a big responsibility. It's given to you directly through Scripture. And I believe that the most effective way for you to fulfill that responsibility is for you to be as informed as possible on what God's Word says about deacon ministry. Does that make sense? So to do that, we're going to start with a passage from Acts chapter 6. The book of Acts is basically the story of the beginning of the New Testament church. A very exciting time, but, but a time that didn't exactly have a, an owner's manual, if, if you know what I mean. You have to remember that although the disciples, who at this point are now referred to as apostles, had the Holy Spirit living inside of them, 
and had been able to draw large crowds of people to faith in Christ, there was, there was no manual for how to organize or run this new invention called the church. And so a lot of what became standard as far as church organization and church practice started off as the apostles dealing with new and unforeseen problems as they arose. It was a lot of experimentation. And Acts chapter 6 is a perfect example of what I'm talking about. Let me read to you, starting in verse 1. But as the believers rapidly multiplied, that's good, there were rumblings of discontent. Well, that's bad, isn't it? The Greek-speaking believers complained about the Hebrew-speaking believers, saying that their widows were being discriminated against in the daily distribution of food. Now remember, when Jesus said, blessed are the meek, the downcast, the orphaned, the widowed, the, the poor in spirit, for they shall inherit the earth. Well, the apostles, when Jesus said that, the apostles took that seriously. So one of the first attempts at ministry was to provide food for widows who did not have the resources to take care of themselves. Unfortunately, one group in the church felt like another group was getting special treatment. Verse 2, so the twelve, that's the apostles, they called a meeting of all the believers. They said, we apostles should spend our time teaching the word of God, not running a food program. Now understand, when they said that, they weren't saying that the food program was unimportant. What they were saying is this, and I would have you write this down. The mission of the early church was, number one, preaching the gospel and teaching the word, amen? And number two, meeting the needs of hurting people. This was their mission. This is what they were to be about. And although both were equally important, and although they were capable, the apostles were capable of doing both jobs well, they couldn't do both jobs well at the same time. And there was only one of those jobs that only they could do. Does I'm going to ask you this multiple times today. Does that make sense? They could do both jobs. They could do them well, but they couldn't do them well at the same time. But there was only one job that only they could do. So if they could only do one job well, it makes sense that they would choose to do the one job that only they could do, which was preaching and teaching God's Word. But... That still left one very important job undone, meeting the needs of hurting people. Verse 3, and so brothers, select seven men who are well respected and are full of the spirit and wisdom. We will give them this responsibility. Then we apostles can spend our time in prayer and teaching the word. And everyone liked this idea and they chose the following. And it lists the names of the men that they chose. Verse 6, these seven were presented to the apostles who prayed for them as they laid their hands on them. And so God's message continued to spread, which was the mission from the very beginning, wasn't it? And the number of believers greatly increased in Jerusalem, and many of the Jewish priests were converted too. Now, it would be easy to think at this point that these men were given basically a scrub job. You know what I'm talking about? Like, they were given, like, the, the low job, waiting on tables, handing out food. And it is actually true that the word deacon in the Greek is not a word that implies any kind of status. It doesn't imply any kind of importance. In fact, just the opposite is true. The word is diakonos in Greek, which literally means a servant. And it's true. They're specifically responsible in the first situation with serving food. But if we take a step back and look at the big picture, I think we'll realize how big their influence on the situation really was. Did you notice what the qualifications were for these men who would be serving food? Verse 3 again. And so, brothers, select seven men who are well-respected and are full of the spirit and wisdom. We will give them this responsibility. Now, let me ask you, what does that tell you? Do you need to be well-respected and full of the spirit and wisdom to only serve food? Yes or no? No. The implication here is that the job, the responsibility, the role is much bigger than this specific task of serving food. Here's what they really did, and here's how the role of deacon has developed over time. The role of deacon is to serve by meeting the needs of people within the church, by helping maintain harmony within the fellowship, 
by freeing the pastors to fulfill their most important responsibilities. Write those down if you would. Now, as you look at that, do you see each of those roles being fulfilled in this story? Yes. So while serving food was the specific tasks they were given, the heart of their responsibility was meeting needs. It was maintaining harmony, and it was freeing the pastors, in this case the apostles, to do their job. So I think you can see there is a big responsibility with the idea of deacons and deacon ministry. Well, with any big responsibility is going to come big requirements, big qualifications. Jesus said in Luke 12, 48, to whom much is given, much is required. And nowhere is that more true than with deacons. So let's talk about the biblical requirements of a deacon. The first three I already mentioned in verse 3, that they are to be well-respected, they are to be full of the Spirit, And they are to be wise. And so, brothers, select seven men who are well-respected and full of the Spirit and wisdom. We will give them this responsibility. So write it down if you would. Well-respected, full of the Spirit, and wise. Then over time, as deacons became more involved in the ministry of the church, the Apostle Paul would give some additional thoughts on the kind of man a deacon should be. And this is now found in 1 Timothy 3. So a little bit to the right in your Bible. In verse 1 through 7... Paul is talking about the qualifications of pastors. And then in verse 8, he transitions to talking specifically about deacons. And listen to what it says. In the same way, in the same way as with pastors, deacons must be well respected and have integrity. They must not be heavy drinkers or dishonest with money. They must be committed to the mystery of the faith now revealed and must live with a clear conscience. Before they are appointed as deacons, let them be closely examined. That's important. If they pass the test, then let them serve as deacons. Here's verse 11. In the same way, their wives must be respected and must not slander others. They must exercise self-control and be faithful in everything they do. A deacon must be faithful to his wife, and he must manage his children and household well. Those who do well as deacons will be rewarded with respect from others and will have increased confidence in their faith in Christ Jesus. Now, let's list out all the requirements that were mentioned. We've already said that a deacon must be well-respected, full of the Spirit, and wise. Verse 8 says they must be a man of integrity. That's important. Part of that integrity included things like not a heavy drinker of alcohol, not dishonest with money. Verse 9 basically says that a deacon must be a committed and growing Christian, which makes perfect sense. Verse 10 says that they are to be already known and proven in terms of service and character. Very important. And then Paul does something kind of interesting. He transitions to the requirements for a deacon's wife. Now, why would he do that? I mean, why does it matter what kind of wife a deacon has? Well, trust me, it matters. And here's why. Because the wife of a deacon is an extension of that man. In fact, I firmly believe, listen to me, this is important, I believe that if a wife doesn't meet the requirements, then neither does the man, even if it seems like he should. So what are the requirements for a deacon's wife? Verse 11 says a qualified deacon has a wife who is respected, who is not a gossip, who is self-controlled, and who is faithful. Okay? So as you consider men over these next few weeks to nominate as a deacon, you need to think about whether or not their wife meets those qualifications as well. And then Paul finishes by talking about the deacon's relationship to his family. Verse 12 says a deacon is to be faithful to his wife. Now, I I need to explain something. Some people have traditionally interpreted this as meaning that a deacon can never have been divorced or remarried. And I understand that, but I believe a more accurate interpretation is that a deacon, listen to me, is to be a one-woman man faithful to his spouse. And then finally, he says a deacon is to be a good manager of his family or a good manager of his home. And hear me, not that his kids are perfect, 
or that his family has never experienced any difficulty, but that he has managed his home and managed his family well. Now, here's what I want you to understand about the requirements for a deacon. Serving as a deacon is about character and heart, listen to me, not status or popularity. In fact, let's all say that out loud. Here we go. Serving as a deacon is about character and heart, not status or popularity. So now, you take all of those characteristics, all of those requirements, those qualifications, and your job, Oakdale Baptist Church, is to superimpose them over the list of men that are found on your deacon nomination sheet. And that's found inside your bulletin that you were handed when you came in this morning. Some of you have already marked off all your deacon nominations, right? Because you're overachievers. Some of you haven't listened to anything I've said so far because you've been reading what the bylaws say, right? All right? So on your list, you're going to take these things we've learned, you're going to superimpose them over that list of men, and here's how I would challenge you to do that. Listen to me. You select only men who meet these requirements to the best of your knowledge. You say, well, I don't even know who all these men are. I mean, I, I have no idea who some of these people are. Well, that's a good point. Let me ask you a question. Do you have any business nominating a man you don't know? Yes or no? Absolutely not. Do not put a check next to anybody that you don't know. You say, well, this guy seems like he might meet all the requirements, but he's only been a Christian for a year, and he's only been around Oakdale for like six months. Okay, well, let me ask you a question. Can a man be tested and proven to meet all these qualifications when he's a baby Christian? Or if he's only been around the church for a short time, yes or no? No. Does that mean he's not a godly man? No. Does that mean that someday he could not serve as a deacon? Absolutely not. It just means that the time isn't quite right yet, and therefore you shouldn't nominate him. Okay? So here's the bottom line. The responsibility to choose deacons, it's a big one. And I, I want to challenge you as a church to take it very seriously, and I want to make sure that you do it very biblically. Okay? So here are your instructions this is for church members only. So listen, if you are a regular attender, if you're a guest, most of the time, we don't make a lot of distinction between church members and regular attenders and guests, but this is an example of a time when we're going to do that. It's important. If you're a church member, you're going to go ahead, in fact, do this right now. Take out this nomination ballot, if you would, and just look at it. And you may only have one of these, if, you, if maybe you're a couple and you only got one bulletin, but we have a stack of these out in the foyer for you, and you can take as many as you need for your family, okay? But take that ballot out, and I want you to notice that one side says new deacon candidate procedures. Let's start on that page at the very top. And, and this details what is included in our church bylaws about the procedure for selecting deacons. And it's pretty detailed, and it's, it's laid out pretty clearly. It's just a lot. But then the other side, if you'll turn it over, is the actual new deacon nomination ballot. And so you see that, and it's got the list of men. This is a list of every man who is 21 years of age or older, who has been, active, who's been an active member for at least one year. Okay? Every man, 21 years of older, who's been an active member for at least one year. If you say, well, wait a minute, so-and-so's name is not on this list, any man who is a current staff member or is already ordained as a deacon or a minister, which we have several of, is not included on this list. Does that make sense? That's why their name is not there. Notice that the instructions, if you look there at the top, say that you are to nominate up to 10 men. And I, I want to make sure you understand that means you do not have to nominate 10 men. But if you feel that there are 10 men that you feel confident nominating, you can nominate up to that amount of people. Does that make sense? You nominate them by placing a check or an X next to their name. And then you're instructed to sign and print your name at the bottom. And when your ballot is complete, and you're going to have a few weeks to do this, when your ballot is complete, you can drop that in one of our offering boxes that are at the back of the church. You say, do we have offering boxes? 
Yes, we do, church members, and you should get familiar with them, okay? If you're not sure where they are, ask a deacon. They will show you, will give you a tour of where all the offering boxes are. If, if not in the offering box, just return it to the church office. You can do that however you like, in person, through the mail, whatever. You do not need to turn it in today, although you can if you're ready. But it will need to be submitted by Sunday, May the 7th. And so there are three Sundays between now and then. You will need to have it turned in by May the 7th. And after that, we will continue on with our deacon process. If you have any other questions, I want you to feel free to ask a staff member or contact the church office and we'll try to answer any questions that you might have. All right? Now, at this point, we're going to transition again. And we're going to bring up a couple of deacons. So let me invite our two deacons who are coming, Marty and Wade are going to come. I'm going to reset the stage here just a little bit, and they're going to come and share with you this morning. Why don't you guys welcome Marty McBee and Wade Deaver. You guys come on up here. Grab one of those stools right there and bring it right here to the front. Right up here. Very good. All right, so Marty McBee is an ER doctor and the regional medical director for a company called Team Health. Marty is married to Sherry and has two adult sons, Tristan and Grayson, and a daughter, Shelby, who's about to graduate from high school in May. Yay, Shelby. Marty and his family have also, they have attended uh, OBC since 2012. And Marty began training as a deacon in 2019 and was ordained in November of 2021. Marty is what's known as a COVID deacon because he started the process before COVID and finished it afterwards. And so it took like two or three times as long as it normally does. Wade Deaver is the vice president of sales for Griffin Media, which is the company that owns News 9 here in Oklahoma City. Wade is married to Susan, has three adult sons, Grant, Cole, and Luke. And the Deavers actually have also attended OBU uh, since 2012. Wade began training as a deacon also in 2019. It was ordained in November of 2021 as well. So both Marty and Wade came in as deacons uh, along with some other guys at the same time. Here's what I've asked them to do. I want them to just very, I'm going to see how well they follow directions. So I will buzz them out if they go too long. Um, but uh, they're going to give us a very brief description of their testimony uh, life before Christ and how they came to Christ. Wade, let's start with you. Yeah, thank you, Justin, and thank you for this opportunity. Um, so I started with, uh, I, in Flint, Michigan, I'm born and raised in Flint, Michigan, and I had a uncle, thank goodness, that um, helped my family, my brothers and sisters and I, uh, learn about Christ. Uh, he was a member of Great Lakes Baptist Church in Flint, Michigan, and he was also the church a bus driver. So every Sunday, he'd pick my brothers and sisters and I up yeah. and take us to uh, Great Lakes Baptist Church. And I was saved and baptized in that church. And uh, you guys heard my, uh, some of you guys heard my full testimony, but my dad was not a Christian at that point. And it was my lifelong uh, mission as a Christian to help my dad become a Christian. And that's where it started. That's awesome. Thank you. Marty, how about you? Uh, he did say, make it short. I don't know if that's possible, but I'll Come on try now. to do it. You can do it. I'll do it. Uh, I didn't grow up in the church. I mean, when I was 12 in 1976, for anybody who can do math can figure the rest of it out. <laughs> um, I spent the summer with my grandmother who went to church every time the doors were open. I got baptized then and knew about Jesus, but I went back home and did what I did. And I was kind of like the roadrunner. I always thought that, like, you know, when he's on the elevator and right before it hits the ground, he just jumps off. I just thought, like, if I'm getting ready to die, I'm just going to talk to the Lord then. And that's kind of how I lived my life till I was about 30 and I got married. And I realized that Jesus is real and he's here every day. Mm. And that's where I want to be. Mm. And that's kind of what I've been working toward ever since. Amen. Amen. I, I appreciate it. I love the Roadrunner example. That's a good, that helps me understand it. Um, so you, you talked about how you came to Christ. Talk about kind of that period between then and when you became a deacon. Maybe that's a long period or maybe it wasn't that long. Wade, start with you. Yeah, you know, so the best decision I made was uh, meeting Susan. Uh, we uh, met in college at 
and uh, during that period of time in college, we, we dated five years before we got married. I was uh, 17 years old when I met Susan, and uh, we had a lot of conversations about what we wanted our life to be uh, once we got married, and obviously God was uh, a center of that. I mean, we talked about um, once we got married and we started to have children, we wanted to make sure that our children were raised in a church. So we moved right after uh, we moved to Dallas in 1991. Uh, joined a church in Dallas, Texas. Uh, it was actually at Carrollton, Texas. And it was a Methodist church, and we started to get really involved and active in that church. And uh, we joined the youth, and we were, you know, youth counselors, and j- started joining committees and teams, and really started to grow in our spiritual in our spiritual growth and our relationship with God. Then we moved to Oklahoma 26 years ago, and lived up in Edmond. Joined the first uh, Presbyterian Church of Edmond. Again, at this time, we started having our sons and started raising our boys in church. Again, got really involved. The boys were involved. And then about 12 years ago, uh, or actually sooner than that, but 12 years ago, we moved to, uh, here and joined OBC. And at that point is when our spiritual growth really took off. Started joining teams and committees and volunteering and, and really started the Bible study and praying and just becoming involved in this community to a point where um, our relationship with God really increased. Marty, how about you? Yeah, it, it's similar to Wade's story. I mean, once again, um, best decision I made was marrying Sherry, and I don't think we uh, dated for five years. I think we dated about five minutes and got married. But at that time, when we started having kids, that was after we got married, just to be clear, <laughs> uh, it became very apparent where I wanted my kids to be mm-hmm. and who I wanted my kids to be and who I wanted to be. And so at that point, we got way more involved in the church, uh, on committees, doing extra stuff. If you look around every Wednesday night, there's something to do. If you look around every Sunday, there's something to do. Right. Whether it's putting up a chair, whether it's helping with something here, something there. And that's what we started doing. We just started getting involved. And once we started getting involved, we started loving it, and we started growing and, and doing the best we could. And so that's what really changed for me. Yeah. You know, and, and I've known these guys during part of this time of their life. And, you know, Wade, uh, his wife Susan is still involved in our youth ministry and serving there. Wade is a guy that I always feel like if I've got something that I need, I know Wade will take care of it. I know Wade will handle it. Marty, I don't know that there's any single person who has invited more people to Oakdale over the last decade than Marty McBee. And he knows everybody. And, uh, and they know him, and they still come a lot of the time. It's amazing. <laughs> it's awesome. It's like a miracle. And uh, we're really, we're just, these, these two guys lived during that season of life, and God was preparing them, I think, for what he was going to do. Let me ask you this. Some of these folks are sitting here. There's some men sitting here who are going to be nominated as deacons. What, how did you feel when you were first asked to consider serving as a deacon? Let me start with Marty. How did you feel when you when they said, "Hey, you've been nominated, and and we want you to consider going through this training"? Yeah, I'm like, bro, you got the wrong guy. <laughs> I mean, you got the wrong number. Somebody just marked my name down. I'm not your guy. Mm-hmm. I'm not worthy. I, I mean, it freaked me out because I I didn't think I was good enough. Mm-hmm. And still to this day, we I think probably any deacon probably thinks the same thing. I I still don't think that I do enough. And so that was my biggest initial thought. Wade, how about you? You know, I remember uh, thinking about it before being asked, and I remember going through and sitting where you are now during the ordination process. I think it was with uh, Jim Dunlap and and John Evans. And I remember thinking at that point, if I were to be asked right now, would I do it? And I didn't feel like at that time I would have because I wasn't ready. And listening to your sermon and talking about the timing um, it wasn't it wasn't right at that point, so I would have said no. But then, you know, a few years later, when Brent asked, the first thought I had too was, okay, am I ready? I don't feel like I'm worthy. I'm going to pray. Let me let me say something. I may be off I may be off the wall in saying this, but if you're sitting here this morning, and you're thinking to yourself, man, I'm so excited about this deacon process. I can't wait because I definitely should be a deacon. I want to humbly suggest to you, you're not ready to be a deacon. I'm, I'm, and I'm not joking. I think that the response for every man who finds out they've been nominated should probably be, there's, of course there are exceptions, but should probably be, 
dude, you've got the wrong guy. And so I just think we ought to consider that. I, I would just say the other thing too, Jason, Justin, you had like eight things listed up there, uh -huh. and the first three was something about respected and being wise. And, and then I think the other one was like chasing after the Lord or something yeah. like that. Yeah. I mean, I was one out of three. And so, like, I'm not wise. I don't, people don't, I don't even know people like me. I, I'm not your guy. Yeah, yeah but, but and yet, I promise you, Marty received lots and lots and lots of nominations. That's how he entered into the process. And the same thing is true for Wade. Wade, what, what do you think has been the biggest blessing of being a deacon? It's going to sound uh, trite, but it's, there have been so many. And it, I could go on and on. Um, I think the biggest blessing has been uh, my spiritual growth as a process um, and learning from the other deacons. Um, I never thought I'd be uh, worthy of teaching a class and the most fun I'm having is teaching the senior saints. Uh, you know, about once a month or so when Daryl is out, I teach. I've learned so much from them. It's, uh, they've challenged me to be more involved with the word of Christ, learning, and, um, and also just getting to know members of the families that uh, I represent and then, of course, the other deacons. Absolutely. Marty, how about you? Biggest blessing? You know, I, I think it's the relationships and, and, and the stuff that we do and being able to serve somebody. And you always hear that kind of weird thing when you go do something for somebody else and you actually think you're doing something for somebody else, but you actually get the biggest blessing. Yeah. And that's what it is for me. Yeah. Uh, trying to serve somebody and thinking I'm helping them, but they're really helping me. Absolutely. And, and I'll just say this really quickly. I love it that, that you guys say, you know, there's so many. There's so much. I, I don't know that I can count them all. Because listen, let, let me say sincerely, every deacon in every church doesn't feel that way. There are lots of churches where it's a burden to be a deacon. And I'm not saying that there aren't burdens. In fact, let's talk about that. What are some of the hard parts of being a deacon, Wade? What would you say? I think the hardest is feeling like you're not doing enough. And... Secondly, you know, we're all sinners, and uh, I've really worked on trying to develop a relationship with God and the Holy Spirit, and the guilt when you're a deacon and when you sin is greater. Okay, because who, to whom much is given, much is required, right? There's a higher standard. Marty, what do you think is the hardest part? It, uh, pretty close to what Wade said. I mean, I have a full-time job. This is a volunteer job right. that requires so much effort, and we never think we do enough. I mean, we just don't. I mean, every single day I could be doing something more. Yeah. And so that's the hardest part for me. Yeah, absolutely. Um, what would you guys give? What would it, if for somebody who's sitting out there who's going to be a prospective deacon, what advice might you give? You know, the first thing I would say is pray about it and to really self-reflect and ask yourself, am I ready to commit? Do I have the time? Am I at a place in life where I can give the time? Because... You know, your primary role, and Justin went through a lot of that, is, is a helper, helping the Absolutely. pastor, helping the church staff, helping the congregation. And then I would say speak to your wife. Uh, you know, Susan and I had a long conversation about this, and it's a big responsibility for her too. And, and Justin just went through that list as well. And, and she wasn't quite sure if she was ready for, to be a deacon's wife. And so we had that conversation. But I'd say pray about it, listen, take some time to reflect, and, and see where God takes you. Yeah. Marty? It, it is a team thing, too. I mean, that's, that's super important. Talk to your wife about it, pray about it, and then actually read about it. I mean, there's lots of deacon books out there. I mean, what a deacon does, how to become a deacon, and then if you have a servant heart. If you don't have a servant heart, it's not your thing. Yeah. I mean, there's lots of stuff we can do around here, stack some chairs and that kind of stuff, which we do. Yeah. But if you don't have a servant heart, it's not for you. Okay, I think that's, I think that's really, really good advice. Now, here's the deal. Uh, it is, it is, I don't, rare, I oft, don't rarely do this, I don't often do this, but I'm going to tell you it's 12.01. I know, okay? Here's what we're going to do. In just a moment, in fact, let me have Jamie and our praise band come. Um, in just a moment, we're going to stand. When we stand, we're going to enter into a time of invitation, of prayer, and I'm going to give you some instructions. If you are a guest if you are someone who needs to leave and, and cannot stay with us for the next 10 minutes, 12 minutes, you are welcome to leave at that time, okay? You do not need to feel obligated to stay. I'm not asking you to leave, 
I'm saying you can if you need to. But what I want us to do is, is to take the next 10 or 12 minutes, and I think there are a couple of things that we need to be in prayer about. I think we need to be in prayer over our deacon selection and nomination and process. There's a list of men. In fact, this would be a great list to take home with you and pray over in the weeks to come. Okay, I want you to pray about your part in this. You may be feeling this thing of, man, I really feel like I should, I'm not a church member, but I really I want to be a part of this. I mean, I want to be involved in this. Maybe God is saying, yes, because you need to be a member of Oakdale, and it's time for your family to come and to do that. We could do that this morning. Maybe after the, the song that we sang this morning, you just need someone to pray for you because you're struggling with fear or anxiety or depression. I'm going to ask Paul and Marwin. I'm going to ask um, some of our deacons, Brian and um, Jim and it, it, John. You guys, if you guys would, I want to ask you guys to come to the front. Go ahead and come right now if you would. And just line up across the front and listen. If nobody needs prayer this morning, that's fine. That's perfectly fine. But let's be available in case somebody does. I'll let Marty and, and Wade go down and stand as well. And why don't we right now stand to our feet. Let's commit to the next seven, eight, nine minutes. Let's let God, let's let the Holy Spirit lead us and give us guidance. Let's be open to his leadership. Let's pray over our deacon selection process. Let's pray for those who are hurting and who need, who need that prayer. Heavenly Father, we lift these things up to you. We entrust all of these things to you. And I pray that right now, in this moment, in the next few minutes, that needs would be met. Needs that maybe even only you know about. But God, we completely trust you. All of this deacon stuff, with our fear, our anxiety, our depression, church membership, whatever it may be, God, we trust you with all of these things. Right here, right now. Speak to us, God. And may we be obedient to you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.